So I'm gonna tell you this story. I don't tell a lot of stories on this channel, but I'm gonna tell you this one because I think it's important. A couple years ago, I lived in this apartment and they started building a seven house development across the street. The lot graders came in and cleared out the lot and they were followed by a little asphalt and concrete company that put in the driveways and a little side street. The foreman on that job was an old guy from the Louisiana Bayou. He was Cajun, he had this amazing accent. He always used to joke with me because I was in construction too. And he always called me boss. And we would chat and swap stories before I got my truck to go to work in the morning. If I had to guess, he was probably pushing 70. There was only two or three guys on his crew and they all seemed to be in their 40s and 50s. So one morning I came out and he was on the job site all by himself. He was down on his hands and knees and he was troweling out a concrete apron. He didn't see me, but I noticed that when he stood up, it looked like he was in pain. He put his hand on his hip and he just didn't seem as happy as usual to be on the job site. I felt bad for him. And when I went by, he saw me and I said, man, you gotta get a young guy to do that for you. And he looked right at me and he said, there ain't no more young guys, boss. And that really stuck with me because looking around my professional world, I realized that he was right. There's a real problem forming and it doesn't get talked about as much as it should because I don't think people realize that we're on the precipice of what could be a real crisis. And we're probably not gonna acknowledge it until we go over the edge. So today, I wanna to try to slow things down a little bit and talk about what's really at stake here. And I'm gonna to try to answer the question that people ask me every week. Where have all the carpenters gone? So the truth is, I haven't actually worked in the field doing the day-to-day -day labor as a carpenter in about a year now. The channel blew up in early 2020 and it changed my life in a lot of ways. One of them is that it pays me now and I don't necessarily have to wear the tool belt anymore. But oddly enough, that's not what pulled me out of the construction field. In fact, I wouldn't have even started a YouTube channel if it wasn't for this other thing. Somewhere in about 2018, I began to develop this fairly serious knee problem. I had plowed up a bunch of cartilage on the back of my right kneecap, and it was making a lot of things very agonizing. Not only was manual labor painful, but some days just standing in line to get a cup of coffee was enough to make me break out in a cold sweat. And it's no mystery to me how this happened. I've been working construction on and off since I was 13. So at 36, I had 20 plus years of crawling in basements, climbing up on ladders and roofs, and carrying heavy materials around. On top of that, I've been working completely alone for the last 10 years. So all the manual labor on a job site fell on me. Now, these things aren't uncommon. That's just part of construction. They call it manual labor for a reason. And the truth is, I love being a carpenter. You get to be outside all day, which is where I'm happiest. You build things that are standing there when you drive away, and every day is different and it's rewarding. But it turns out, I just didn't have the sort of knees that were gonna get me to 70 in the field like my friend from Louisiana. In fact, it looked like they weren't even gonna get me to 40 if I didn't do something quick. So out of desperation, I started a YouTube channel. And it somehow grew to almost 300,000 subscribers in about three years. As far as I'm concerned, it defies all explanation. But this is my job now, and I try to take it seriously, and I try to do it well. And yet every week, without fail, I still get calls from old clients or would-be new clients asking if I can do work for them. And I have to tell them, I'm out. I had knee surgery. I had to stop. They always say, oh, God, we're sorry to hear that. Do you know anybody else who does good carpentry? And the crazy thing is, I don't have a single name anymore of someone that I can recommend in the area. Not one. I'm a carpenter, and I don't know any other good, independent carpenters. How does that happen? I mean, it's no mystery that trade participation is down. And I'm talking across the board, across the country, at all times. I'm not going to get into a lot of hard statistics, because there are already a lot of other organizations and publications out there that are heavily researching this stuff. Like my friend Misha Fisher, who is the chief economist for Angie's List and Home Advisor. I'll link some of his stuff below, as well as some other journals and publications that talk about these things. But these reports have been saying for years now what most everyone already knows on some level. Young people aren't going into the trades as much. They're getting four-year degrees, they're going to work for corporations and tech companies. From what I've read, something like 75% of contractors across industries have said that the shortage is preventing them from taking on more work and growing. The average age of trade workers is constantly getting older and the younger pool is shrinking. This is hard fact, and it's hitting every corner at once. And yet, from my point of view, not all trades are experiencing this equally. When my old clients call and they need the name of a good carpenter, I got nothing to offer. But if they ask me for a plumber, or an electrician, or an HVAC specialist, 
I can throw out 10 names. They could have someone good at their door that afternoon to give them a bid or possibly even start doing work. If they need a roofer, I got five companies to throw out. Painters, drywallers, got a dozen of each. And yet I can't give them a single decent carpenter that's essentially doing what I was doing in the field. Now why in the world is that? Frankly, it's because carpentry is a tough gig. Carpenters have a lot of responsibilities. Think about it. We live in the age of specialization. The mortgage crisis of 2008 decimated the construction industry. You had mid-size and large construction companies all over America essentially vanish overnight. They disbanded their workforce, and for some years, these people were without jobs. They drifted into other industries, some line of work that wasn't quite so boom or bust. Some of them remained in construction in more specialized, smaller fields, but a lot of them didn't. They were forced to go on to something that seemed more reliable, something that would always be there and would always pay. And of all the factors involved, it's that last word that makes all the difference. Pay. Why aren't there as many carpenters around as there used to be? Frankly, because it doesn't pay that much. And yet our responsibilities as carpenters are vast. Painting and drywall are simpler trades. Now, that does not make them easy. I've always said there's an art form to both. Plumbing, on the other hand, is very complex. There's a lot to learn, things have to be done right, and there's a small margin for error. But there are much better training programs associated with plumbing. It's a more regulated industry. And once you know plumbing, it has a more contained job description. In the field, you're probably either roughing in new houses or you're doing repair work on older houses. And the same goes for electrical and HVAC. If you're an electrician, every day is wiring, fixtures, and panels. If you're an HVAC technician, every day is AC units and furnaces. You really get to focus down. And on top of that tighter focus, you get paid. According to Home Advisor, most licensed plumbers make $80 to $130 an hour. In my area, it hovers right around $100. Electricians in my area frequently charge between $70 to $90 an hour. No one bats an eye at that. HVAC technicians, if they're licensed and independent, can easily charge $100 to $150 an hour. And then your carpenter shows up and charges 25 to 50 an hour. That's half or less. And on any given job, we may be asked to do an insane variety of things. Build or repair fences, gates, decks, sheds. We may be asked to frame in new walls or ceilings, to repair rotted joists or structural posts, or to trim out whole rooms or even do custom built-ins. We might hang doors, windows, and cabinets or run all the siding and exterior trim on your whole house. Along the way, we may fix every little broken handle or missing threshold that you have. And we do it all in my area for like 30 to $50 an hour. And a lot of this is hard, back-breaking work carrying a lot of weight in adverse conditions. We're just a step below the masons who have the hardest, most demanding labor out there, along with the roofers who constantly work in danger of falling. Now my point here is not to bemoan how difficult we have it. As I said, I love being a carpenter. It's my chosen profession. Carpentry is like romantic. It's the most romanticized trade. But when a young person comes up to me and says, I'm thinking about getting into the trades, should I become a carpenter? At this point, I feel obligated to look them in the eye and say, no, don't do it. Go get your plumbing certification, your HVAC training. Do your two to four year apprenticeship. Learn as much as you can. And as soon as you can, go out on your own. Make those big bucks, put it away. You play your cards right as a plumber, you can die a multi-millionaire and have plenty of money along the way. Don't be like me. Don't blow your knee out at 36 and have to rely on a YouTube career to finally have the money to pay to fix it. That's the reality of our jobs and the trades. We will have to sell to some degree our bodies and our health for money. That's the hard truth of the matter. Now, many of you out there might be watching this and saying, you're not helping anything right now. Here, I'm supposed to be an advocate for the trades, and I'm telling young people it's going to destroy your body and leave you poor. But I'm not actually talking to them. I'm talking to you, the viewer, who hires tradespeople for work. You're the one who's holding the checkbook. And the message I have for you might actually be a little bit scarier. Because I only see one way out of this labor shortage crisis. In the future, there's a good chance that you're going to have to pay more for everything. The old timers, like my concrete buddy, they're aging out. They can't work forever. In the next generation who needs to fill their shoes, why are they going to come do it? Organizations like the National Association of Home Builders 
want to advocate for people to get back into the trades. They want to make it seem cool again and worthwhile, which it is. But I'm sorry, it being cool is never going to bring these kids back. There is only one thing that has ever historically motivated people to do difficult jobs. Money. And I'm not talking about 60000 a year. I'm talking about a lot more. Towards the end of my functional career, I started charging 70 or more an hour if I even did hourly work. And I would frequently hear from people, it just shouldn't be that much for a carpenter. And I wanted to reply, says who? Who really sets that value? I live in Raleigh. There are people a mile down the street at Red Hat making $175,000 a year. And I'm not saying they don't deserve it. That job is difficult. It takes a lot of training. Not a lot of people are probably qualified to do it. But you know what? This job is hard too. And on a blazing hot summer day, I dare say it's a lot harder. And on top of that, I don't see that many people qualified to do it anymore. In 1950, carpenters and tradespeople were everywhere. These days, we're getting pretty thin on the ground. And in any other industry, scarcity drives up value. So in the not too distant future, when we really fall off this labor shortage cliff, everybody in America who lives in a house or building, which is darn near everybody, is going to have to ask themselves, how much is a carpenter really worth? And if you want kids to say, it's worth it to me to become one, then you're going to have to make sure that jobs like these start paying the same as jobs like this. Otherwise, every house and building in America is going to wind up looking like this. Anyways, that's my rant for the week. I'll be back with my usual content next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Ethan James with The Honest Carpenter. I'll see you next time.